Today's luncheon is sponsored by Benton Franklin Community Health Alliance, headed up by Executive Director Carol Moser. In addition to sponsoring today's luncheon, the Health Alliance has been a valuable partner in the creation of the Good Health is Good Business program, which you'll hear more about in today's program. Please help me welcome Carol Moser, Executive Director of the Benton Franklin Community Health Alliance. Thank you. How's everybody feeling today? You feeling healthy? A little stressed out? Like me? <laughs> well, you know, exercise is good for stress, and so that's one of the reasons that we're here today, is to find out how we can become healthier. But before I go any further, I have to take this opportunity to ask, how many of you have taken the Community Health Needs Survey? Good. Well, thank you, because we are trying to get at least 2,000 surveys by next Wednesday. That's when the survey closes. So at everybody's table, if you have not taken this survey, please go to www.bfcha.org and please help us assess the health of the community. So I want to introduce and talk a little bit about the Health Alliance and who uh, the Alliance represents, and the Alliance was actually born in 1993 after the successful building of the Tri-Cities Cancer Center. And it was such a cooperative and successful event that the hospital CEOs decided that they were going to continue this collaboration, and those are my bosses. They are the four CEOs of our four area hospitals, and representing those CEOs today I have with me. Lisa Teske from Kennewick General Hospital, who's representing Glenn Marshall. I have Denise Clapp, who's representing John Searle, who's the CEO and president of Lord's Health Network. Um, Lane Savage was supposed to be here. He's the president of Cadillac um, Regional Medical Center. And also join, joining the group was, um, is Prosser Medical Hospital, Prosser Memorial Hospital, Julie Peterson. The other two board members are Bob Burden, from Group Health Cooperative, and Jason Zakaria from the Benton Franklin Health District. So these gentlemen um, set the direction for the Health Alliance, and that is based on the community health needs, and that's why the assessment is very important to us right now, because we need to understand the gaps in our, in our health delivery system. When the group was established in 1993, they met and they defined the purpose of the Health Alliance, which remains today. And I want to read that purpose to you. It is to bring the community and healthcare providers together to work cooperatively, to foster community-wide stewardship, and assess community health needs and facilitate solutions that achieve affordable, high-quality wellness and accessible health care. So that is the mission of the Alliance. We have eight working committees that address certain areas of health. That's the Health Access Team, the Mental Health Committee, Oral Health Coalition, the Patient Safety Network, the Pain Management Network, the Community Council, the Food and Fitness Coalition, and the Community Health Needs Assessment Steering Committee. And with that, I thank them for the service. I thank this, uh, the Chamber for the opportunity to be today's sponsor. And I thank John Rode for coming here. Go Lions, we're fellow Lions. And Jerry Lynch, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, uh, do we have our guest here? Okay, uh, Lori Lancaster, are, are you in the building? There you are, okay, great. Well, come on up. Lori is the um, executive director of the uh, Benton Franklin Fair and Rodeo and uh, here to tell us about what's hot in the community. Hi everyone, I just want to uh, give you a couple minutes of uh, information about the fair. I know it's Water Follies Week and that's where a lot of our focus is. Where my focus is when I drive by Columbia Park is the porta potties. The next place you will see those same porta potties is at the fair. They pick them up and move them. Yes, they are cleaned, but that's how I know the fair's right around the corner is when I see the staging area set up in the park. So we're about 25 days away from the fair. 
and we're always looking forward to uh, the water follies and then the fair comes right around the corner finishing off the summer for the Tri-Cities. We have about 115,000 people come through our gates in five days, so it is quite a large event. And we have a great lineup of entertainment this year. We have REO Speedwagon, we have Hinder, we have Big and Rich, we have Fog Hat, and we have Jared Neiman. So we have a little bit of something for everyone. We have your classic rock, we have your 80s, I call it junior high prom music from REO Speedwagon. We have Young Country, we have a big show with Big and Rich on Thursday night, and uh, just a lot of fun for everyone to come out. Concert seating is free with your fair admission, so we hope to see you all there. It is a great bargain. This year we also have the Extreme Bull Riding event on Tuesday night, and you will see 50 uh, bulls come out of the chutes. You probably won't see 50 cowboys stay on 50 bulls, but they'll be there when they start and come out of the gate, we guarantee it. So we're looking forward to having everyone come out the last week of August. We're August 21st to the 25th this year. The parade will be August 18th in downtown Kennewick, and it always is a great draw and a great event for us. And we look forward to having you guys all come out and see us at the fairgrounds in Kennewick. Thank you, Camille. Beginning this month, we've added a new component to the Chamber's monthly luncheon so that we can recognize members throughout the year, rather than just once a year at the annual meeting. The Chamber's Award and Recognition Committee will be selecting members throughout the year to highlight oh, another script malfunction. To highlight businesses throughout the year. So the Tri-Cities Regional Chamber of Commerce is pleased to announce Tidewater is our first recipient of the Outstanding Member of the Month. The Chamber's Award and Recognition Committee selected Tidewater for their outstanding efforts and contributions to the Tri-Cities and for going above and beyond in their efforts to provide barges for the annual River of Fire Festival. As you can all imagine, the River of Fire would not, festival would not be the same and would not be able to feature a spectacular fireworks show on the Columbia River without a barge. We tried doing it on land, it just didn't work. Tidewater's most generous donation of the barge and their supportive staff has been paramount to the success of the entire event. In business for over 80 years and headquartered in Vancouver, Washington, Tidewater's operating area spans 465 miles of the Columbia and Snake River systems, extending from the port of Astoria, Oregon to the port of Lewiston, Idaho. Accepting the award on behalf of Tidewater is Mark Davis. Would you like to come up, Mark? Thank you, Mark, the Chamber, and the entire community really appreciates your company's dedication and support. You know, I'd like to, to tell you a little story. Um, I've, uh, I've been a small businessman here in Tri-Cities uh, since 1996, and uh, I started my business with, um, you know, some dreams and aspirations like all new business owners do, and, and uh, early, in the early years, I didn't want to have too many rules. I kind of wanted to let my employees be themselves and um, do what they, they felt was best and not try to dictate their lives, and uh, that worked for a while, and uh, then reality sets in, and you realize as a business owner that you have to deal with things like the rising cost of insurance and a number of other factors that come into play when you're running a business that depend on your people being responsible um, at work all the time and good, good health and such. And um, a few years ago at the Chambers um, luncheon, we had a, a speaker um, from the um, Washington Policy Center, Dr. Roger Stark, who talked about 
the cost of health care, but he, he took an, a unique approach, I think. He, he approached it from the perspective of how can we all be better consumers of health care? How can we help to control costs of health care by our actions? And that really hit home with me. Um, so I began to try to implement some things in my business that encouraged our employees to live healthier lives, improve productivity, decrease absenteeism, the kind of things that all businesses really benefit from. And then a couple of years ago, I had um, an employee whose spouse became ill and was um, stricken with lung cancer. Um, this employee and her husband both smoked. And to my astonishment, um, despite the diagnosis, they did not choose to stop smoking. And um, unfortunately, um, her spouse did not survive the lung cancer. And, um, but that, that again really said something to me about um, how maybe as an employer I could help influence people's lives. Um, a year later, that very same employee became sick again. And this time around, I said, that's it. Um, I'm outlawing smoking in the workplace. You just can't smoke when you're on the clock for me. And um, I had a number of employees quit over that. But the thing is, they didn't quit work, they quit smoking. And that really told me that as a, as a business person and as a business community, we have an opportunity to really have a positive influence on people's lives. So fast forward a couple of years later, and um, Lori Matson asked me to be board chair this year, and I said, you know, this is something I would like to do as an initiative um, in my term, a program that, it, that gets all of our businesses on board, um, encouraging their employees to live better lives, be more productive. It's um, truly that good health is good business. And then along came John Rode. Um, and that was uh, really a perfect tie-in to our program. When I began to read about John, I called Lori up and said, we got to get that guy. And, and uh, fortunately, he called us. So um, that really worked out well. Um, and the, so the Chamber's been looking forward to this day for a number of months since we first spoke to John back in January. We knew that he was the perfect choice for the speaker to launch the Good Health is a Good Business Challenge. So thank you, John, for agreeing to be here today. John was born and raised in Kennewick. He was a student athlete at Kennewick High. Life had become very difficult for John after becoming overweight by the third grade. John developed a sense of humor to help him combat negative comments from thoughtless classmates. As a freshman in high school, John stood six feet tall and weighed a whopping 285 pounds. He worked very hard to become physically fit. He devoted hours of his time <coughs> in the high school weight room. He graduated from high school standing six foot four and weighing 240 pounds. But while he was diligent in the weight room, he was perhaps a bit lackadaisical in the classroom. And is academic, academically suspended for the first half of the football season his senior year. Unfortunately, he never achieved his football goals. After a lot of help from his head coach, Ed Troxell, John received a scholarship to play football at the junior college level, but struggled with his failure to live up to the standards that he set for himself. Devastated by the feelings of failure and the thought that his best years were behind him, John developed an eating disorder. In May of 2011, John was cast to be on the NBC hit reality TV show, The Biggest Looter, Loser Battle of the Ages, and his life changed forever. John arrived at the Biggest Loser Ranch in June of 2011, just a little over 12 months ago, weighing 445 pounds. At the ranch, John was instructed by personal trainers, nutritionalists, and doctors regarding healthy living, proper diet, and exercise. John's experience at the ranch was an emotional journey, to say the least. 
He battled and confronted the inner demons that caused his eating disorders, he, his weight gain, and his unachieved athletic goals. During the filming of the show, John was very focused and dedicated himself to honoring the sacrifice his wife and two sons were making by allowing him to leave for several months to be a contestant on the show. At the Biggest Loser live finale, which aired on December 13, 2011, John won the show's grand prize of $250,000 by weighing 225 pounds. That's a grand total of 220 pounds lost, or about 49% of his body weight. But John is also a winner because he has won his life back and more time with his family. And that's a quote. John continues to live his healthy lifestyle just like these days on the ranch. Since the finale, John has shared his story on Live with Kelly, The Today Show, Access Hollywood, The Wendy Williams Show, The Dr. Drew Show, New York Live, and numerous NBC affiliates across America. He has been featured in TV Guide, People Magazine, In Touch Magazine, U.S. Weekly, OK Magazine, as well as several other publications. John has been featured in countless other print and web publications, and he's currently sharing his story of health, wellness, and weight loss as a public speaker to groups and organizations of all types. And he's working on his first book. He continues to inspire others by competing in several running events, including the Los Angeles Marathon in March 2012. John and his wife, Jill, have two boys, Daniel and Dimitri. Please help me welcome John Rhodes. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here and, and being part of this moment in time. <clears throat> I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, I learned a lot in my time on uh, The Biggest Loser. Most importantly, I learned how to strengthen myself from within. I find that the most difficult thing for people is to understand how to start this journey. And for me, what worked for me is being very open and very honest and very real, figuring out why I wanted to change. What is it? And the easiest parallel for me to draw is weight loss. If someone comes to me and says, I want to be a certain size, you know, if I want to fit into skinny jeans and that's my goal, that's probably not a good enough motivation. There's something more to it. Not everybody's story's the same. We're all unique. We're all different. Sometimes I liken myself to a three-legged table. I had a lot going on good in my life, but I was not complete. I put up walls, barriers, to keep myself safe and secure from things that I was either ashamed of, embarrassed of, didn't want to deal with. I would oftentimes overeat to the point where I, I would suffer from stomach pain. And I later found out the reason I was doing that was just to feel something. So motivation begins with your real reason for why you want to change. And it doesn't just have to be weight loss, it can be anything. But you find that real motivation, that true and honest motivation. You don't have to share it with anyone. If you know what it is, that's enough. Because then you can draw on that when things get difficult. When you don't want to get up and get going again and do the things you need to do, you can draw on that. I was very fortunate to go through the casting process for The Biggest Loser. All told, it took about three months started off with a casting call and sitting at a, a couple of banquet tables with some other people that all wanted to be on the show. And then I got a call back and I went to a hotel and I did a filmed interview that was going to be sent to the NBC executives. And then after a couple of months of endless emails and paperwork and, and doctor's examinations and nervousness and just curiosity whether I'd make the show or not, I was fortunate enough to be invited out to California for what they call finals. 
So we stayed at the Four Seasons Hotel, and I was cooped up in that hotel for a couple of weeks as we went through the process and we got uh, examinations of every type, mental, physical, emotional. We met with nutritionists. We met with uh, uh, physical trainers. We met with doctors. And then one day, they called us down, handed out shirts with numbers on them, and said, hey, can you guys do us a favor? And we just need to just take a quick picture of everybody just real quick. It's no big deal. They snapped this picture, and then they announced that we were going to be the contestants of season 12 of The Biggest Loser. And it was a very um, pivotal time in my life because I was so sick of being in that hotel and not knowing after months and months of wondering, am I going to be on this silly show or not? Just let me know now. I got to the point where I said, fine, I'm going to make that change. I'm so desperate to have a better life. I'll make that change whether I get on your show or not. And fortunately, I got on the show. So that was kind of nice. When I was on the show, my motivation was honoring and respecting the sacrifice that my family was making as I was away. I was away for 123 days. I worked out between six and eight hours a day every day, and I probably had about eight days off in those 123 days. But the days off weren't really a day off, because the day off was a day we were being weighed in. And you never know, is this the week I come up short? Is this the week I plateau? Was it enough? I'll tell you something. I was not happy unless I knew I was safe. If I knew I was safe from elimination, then I would be all smiles and happy, yay, celebrate. Because in all honesty for me, it didn't matter how much weight I lost unless it was enough to be safe. Some people um, on the ranch were happy, oh yay, I lost eight pounds. Good for you, am I safe? So finally the producers got, they got the, the satellites linked up and they, they got the hint. They're like, okay, what we'll do is we'll have John know whether or not he's safe. If you want to see a reaction out of John that's happy, let's just make sure that we weigh him so he knows he's safe. Yeah, and then I'll give you a reaction. I yelled, holy crap, when I knew I was safe, about seven or eight weeks in. I had some incredible moments. I had some turbocharged. It felt like being in an emotional pressure cooker. But it was wonderful. And I would do it all over again because I found out about what my true motivation is. My true motivation has changed over time. My true motivation now is I want to develop a hedge against decrepitude. I don't want to be in a rest home. I saw what my father went through. I don't want that in my life. I want to take care of my body, and I want to live a high quality of life for as long as possible. I want to be able to function, take care of myself, do for myself and do for others. That's what motivates me now. And it ebbs and it flows and it grows. Your motivation can change, that's fine. You'll meet a goal, you'll, you'll accomplish that goal, set a new one, always growing. Bob Harper said something to me very important and it kind of freaked me out. We were about halfway through the show, we were shooting the Thanksgiving episode, which was like in August, so it was weird. And he says to me, you can only win the show once. And I thought, oh my gosh, because I'm killing myself. I mean, you guys saw, I'm killing myself day in and day out. I didn't go there to play games, I went there to win. I went there to put myself to the test and figure out, prove to myself, am I as tough as I think I used to be? Am I as mentally tough as I think I am? Am I even half the man that I pretend to be? I found out so much about myself, so much more that I could never even dream of. So when Bob told me you can only win the show once, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? So I announced, yeah, I'm gonna run in the LA Marathon. And so I've probably run in, I think, like four full marathons and four half marathons. Uh, since October. And so I used the marathons to keep myself going because I, I would announce it so I'd be tied to it. I'd have to do it. I'd have to prepare for it. I'd have to be ready for it. I didn't have a choice. And now I've kind of matured in that process. I don't announce, oh, I'm going to be in this marathon. I'm going to be in that marathon. I work out. I do functional workouts at high intensity and I constantly change it up. I do CrossFit now to keep myself on track. That's what I found to be successful for me. My foundation for change is my desire to give back. My truth is that I have an obligation. No one's come and told me you have an obligation. I feel as though I have an obligation. I feel like a spoiled child who's been given everything. I want to give to, I want to share, I want to help. That is part of my drive. We need to be open and honest with ourselves in everything we do. If you can be open and honest with yourself and with others, you might lose some friends, you might gain some friends, but ultimately, you won't be keeping things in, you won't be suppressing things. It's that three-legged table I spoke of earlier. You need to be complete, that table needs four legs. 
to be strong, withstand whatever issues life may give you. Because no, life isn't fair. Life can be dirty and mean, just like my time at the ranch. You can be eliminated from life. Things can happen. Things change. You need to be generally prepared for anything. When I taught emotionally disabled students at the high school level, I taught um, them the fact that maybe I can't go in and change your life. I can't take away your issues and your problems, but I can strengthen you and help you bear up your problems better. Those are the things that are important. And so when you're open and honest and you really understand what it is you're facing, you're better prepared to make that happen. It's difficult for me to see myself. When I first got home and we were to watch the first two episodes before I returned to run the marathon, I cringed at the thought of watching myself. It was awful. And of course, everybody wanted to watch with me. And so we went to a friend's house and they have a big theater and 30 of us jammed in there. And here's big old fat John just killed me to see myself like that. What I'd done to myself. And then to know at the end of that episode, I wouldn't have my shirt on. Just very daunting, very awful to say the very least. I still keep my driver's license. I've not updated my photo. I don't ever want to forget. My largest fear is that I will return to look like that, and I don't want that. People want to know, what does it take? What does it take to develop focus? Okay. You must have a desire. You've got to have a want. But that want alone, that's not enough. But it can be a starting point. You can take that desire, that want, and couple it with your motivation. Okay. Put that together with some sacrifice because every single thing worth having in life requires sacrifice. Think about it. Think of anything and everything of value in your life right now that you possess. It costs someone something somewhere. Sacrifice is attached to everything worth having. I would find myself being a daydreamer, a time waster, before I went to the ranch. I would sit on the couch and I would waste hours. I would sit on the internet and I would waste hours. And I can honestly say, when I was out at the ranch, I did not waste one single minute. I can't say that about any other period in time in my life. I guarantee you, I was sitting playing on the internet this morning when I got up, I guarantee it. But when I was out there, of course, there was no internet, there was no television, there was no phone calls. You could write letters, you could rest, you could sit by the pool. There were opportunities to lollygag and to mess around. But I can honestly say that I got up every morning and I went and I started my routine and I did the same thing every day, day in and day out, Groundhog Day. More boring than you can possibly imagine. But let me tell you what, it paid off. Unfortunately, when you're at the ranch, they have something they like to call continuity. I call it that sucks. They wouldn't, let you, they wouldn't let you cut your hair. So my wife likes my hair a little bit longer. I went out to California with my hair a little bit longer and it kept getting longer and longer. And then I kept doing interviews and the wind would be coming from behind and I'd have some gel in my hair and it would look like I'd have a growth coming out of the side of my hair. That's my comb over period. It was a, it was a dark period for me. Um, but I do love asparagus, I will tell you that. That's something else, uh, my, my palate completely changed. Oh my goodness, I used to buy $10 worth of candy every day and take it home and sometimes hide it, sometimes eat it, whatever. I thought I was the biggest candy holic ever. And after going through this process, I learned, no, I like carbs, I'm a carb guy. But I also learned that I like vegetables. I made myself eat it because I wanted to win, but now I eat it because I like the taste. Couldn't stand guacamole before, love it now. A little too much, got to be careful. But there's good fat in guacamole. And nuts too, there's good fat in nuts. There's this whole thing out there that people are like, oh, you got to reduce the fat, you got to reduce the fat. No, you don't. You need to put the right kind of fats in your body. Your body needs a little bit of those fats, okay? Something else really quick. I learned when I was at the ranch that I needed to renegotiate my relationship with food. Food is fuel. I used to use food as comfort and escape an excuse, whatever, a release, okay? It is fuel for your body. You gotta get that through your head. And it took me a, a horrendous experience to learn that. Hopefully, I can share with others and so they can learn from my mistakes and my folly so they don't have to go through what I went through to figure out food is fuel.
So some important things that I learned while I was out there is that you do need to learn from your past. You don't need to beat yourself up, okay? Yes, it was tough to hear my life being read out loud up here, okay? Fortunately, there's some happy stuff. You know, we ramped up to the happy because, you know, all that first stuff was like, wow, that was awful. But I have to hear it and own it. I don't have to dwell on it. It's true. It's in the books. But it's behind me. It's over. It doesn't define me. Something else I learned at the ranch. No one else defines me. I define me. You can try and twist and turn my words. You can try and edit me and make me look like a certain type of guy. Let me tell you this. I define me, me and me alone. I will define myself every day. That is on me. That's my obligation. It's my responsibility. And I'm thrilled to have that privilege, to be able to define myself and to know that I am mentally strong and tough enough that no one else gets to define me. I get to define me. That was something that's priceless. I'd go do it all over again, all 123 days again, just to prove that point. You do need to plan for the future. People want to talk to me about how do you eat right when you're on the road. You've got to plan, whether you're at home or on the road. It is important to plan, and it's more than just your meals. It's also your workouts. Be realistic. Some people want to dive into exercise and go nuts. Well, you're going to burn yourself out. You're going to end up miserable, hurt, broken. You don't have to do that. You can ease into things. If you're going to start doing one of these wellness programs, you don't have to go over the top. I know I'm an over-the-top guy. I don't have a choice. I found myself at 445 pounds holding a 20-pound medicine ball, walking at 3.5 miles an hour on a 3.5 incline on a treadmill all of a sudden, and some crazy LA trainer in my face. I normally, I don't know about you guys, but in the old days when I used a treadmill, you know, maybe I'm at a 1.0 incline and maybe I warm up with like, you know, a 1.0, 1.5, 2.0. No, we were straight on that thing and then hands me a medicine ball. Are you nuts? So please, if you're going to embark on a fitness program or if you're going to ramp up what you're currently doing, be wise with that, okay? Live in the real right now. I used to say live right now, but the show psychologist taught me to live in the real right now. Make an accurate assessment. Maybe you're having a bad day. Okay? Maybe you made a mistake. Just be open, honest, and real. It is the only way to be. You don't have to suppress things. You don't have to hide things. Explain yourself. Talk yourself through situations. Life is too short and too precious. There's too much work to be done. There's too much fun to be had to worry about suppressing things and hiding things and being emotionally dishonest with yourself. I have found that my life will never be the same. And I embrace that. I'm grateful for that change. I still have a long ways to go, okay? Harper was right. You can only win the show once, but guess what? You can have a great day every day after if you want it, if you're ready for it and you commit to it. I have my ups and my downs, but I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't do anything different. I'm able to go and do things now that I didn't think I'd ever get to do at my age. This is a photograph of us doing the Jacob's Ladder Challenge. Jacob's Ladder and I have a love-hate relationship. And I'm not going to tell you who's who. I climbed 5,280 feet in less than 90 minutes. I took three 20-second rest breaks. I could see Sunny's display, so I knew where she was all the time. I couldn't see Ramon's. But he and I were open and honest another, you know, with each other. You know, he could see my and I would, you know, he would tell me where he was at. I always made sure that I stayed at least a minimum of 100 feet ahead of Sonny at all times. I knew that I had to do this. I knew that I had to win this challenge. What was at stake was a one pound disadvantage. What did it cost me? Right side of my hand was numb for two months because I would just jam it in that machine to hold myself up. I poured more sweat in that event than you can possibly imagine. That event right there was so huge. That event right there is what kept me at the ranch and kept me safe. I had a one pound disadvantage to give out and I pondered over that for two days, who should I give that to? And I gave it to the one person that would keep me safe. I gave it to Sonny and I was safe by 0.01%. Uh, I uh, joked in one of my interviews and I said if I ever fell below the yellow line it would take an act of Congress to keep me on the show. I can tell you right now, if I even touched that yellow line, I'm sure my bags would have already been in a van somewhere. 
I was so grateful. That challenge at the time was awful, but I learned mental toughness. I learned how to disconnect my mind from my body and just let my body do its thing, not let my mind cloud it and tell the body that it can't do something. I don't uh, suggest that anyone here try to climb 5,280 feet in less than 90 minutes. Uh, you don't want to do that. I wanted to win the show from day one. I'd be lying if I said otherwise. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. Every single week that I was on the scale, I was petrified. I was so nervous. Every single week I was like, oh my gosh, this will be the time, this will be the time. I can clearly remember the week where Bonnie beat me and Becky beat me. They both beat me and I was just like, I'm a dead man, I'm done. But then Dolvet was singing next to me and I, I can't do it justice, but he was singing, it's not over till it's over. I won't even try and sing it because it, it, it won't come across well. But he was singing that, and I'm like, he's just trying to be nice. He's just trying to be nice. I literally, my heart was pounding. I'm sure you could see my red shirt just jumping around. I was just so distraught every single week. My routine stayed the same. I did the same things over and over because it worked. Okay? I made things manageable. I didn't go in there thinking, hey, I'm going to lose 220 pounds in six months. That's insane. You don't do that. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to lose 70 pounds in three weigh-ins and set a record. No. Oh, I'm going to lose 101 pounds in six weigh-ins and set a record. No. I thought to myself, oh, dear heavens, can I live through tomorrow? There would be points in time where I would just worry about getting through the next 20 minutes of a workout. I distinctly remember trying to get through 90 seconds of a workout. Okay? We can have that same feeling in our life. It doesn't always have to be about fitness. You can just think to yourself, can I just get through today? Can I just get through tomorrow? And then maybe if you use some of these techniques, you can strengthen yourself. And instead of thinking, oh, can I just get through? Maybe you can get a little bit of swagger, a little bit of self-confidence. You can think, yes, not only am I going to survive, I'm going to thrive. Because ultimately, that is where you're recognizing your true potential, is when you're willing to take on whatever the problem is, whether it's a home or work, whatever the issue is, when you are ready to take that head on and not just survive but thrive, that's when you know you're in a good place and you're tough mentally and you're prepared for anything that life will throw at you. It's not easy to get there, but trust me, many of you are there and all of us can get there. I remember I was out uh, at the season uh, 13 finale and I met with the three finalists. Uh, NBC had me set up a little press pass so I could walk backstage and mingle. And I went in and I talked to each one of the three, just like the previous winner came in and talked to myself and Antone and Ramon. And I went in and I talked and I talked to, the, I talked to Jeremy. And I'm um, like, how do you feel? He's like, I don't know, I'm nervous, I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, okay, you'll be okay, it's gonna be okay. And I went in and talked to his sister, Conda. And uh, anyway, <laughs> it was interesting. She didn't know what she was gonna do. She didn't know if she was gonna win. And then I went in and talked to Kim. She's the one that used to be the, the uh, uh, wrestler. And she's like, oh, I got this, I got this. I'm like, oh no, don't say that. And she didn't. So you never assume victory. Just put forth your best effort. Give it your best, because whatever happens, you'll know you put your whole self into that. You left nothing to risk. You left nothing. You gave everything you had. You know you did your best. I got third place in the marathon. I'm not a third place kind of guy, but let me tell you what, for the marathon, I'll take third place. I got beat by a 23-year-old and a 24-year-old. I lost the whole marathon by only 10 minutes. I lost second place by only five minutes. Not too shabby for the old man, okay? I mean, do I look like a marathon runner? I mean, be honest, you're not gonna hurt my feelings, you can't. I don't look like a marathon runner. There's a few of you folks out there that look like you do, okay? God bless you. Let me just tell you this, okay? How do you run a marathon? At this point in time, I weigh 281 pounds. Now, I weighed in at 267, but when I was out there, I had carbo-loaded, yeah, 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 lots of fluids. 281 is what you see right there, okay? 26.2 miles. Oh, my goodness. Raise your hand if you've ever run a full marathon. 26.2. Get them up. Be proud of yourselves, okay? Frightening. Yeah, round of applause. Seriously, kid you not. I only had about two and a half weeks to prepare for the marathon from one because I lasted so long on the show and I made the most of my time. Ultimately, all I did, I jogged for four minutes and I walked for one minute. That's all. 
That's all I worried about. I didn't think about, oh my, I'm going to run for five hours, 15 minutes and five seconds. Are you nuts? No. Four and one, baby. Four and one. That's all I worried about. Okay? I didn't get to have music. I had some guys in a minivan blowing dust in my face with a camera, wanting to talk to me all the time. You know, not all the creature comforts. Now, I did have a guy with a little golf cart who'd come up and give me Gatorade and water and juices and stuff like that whenever I needed it, which was nice. Because now when I run a marathon or a half marathon, I keep looking for the golf cart guy. I'm like, hmm, when's that cat going to show up? He's not there. Four and one, that's all I worried about. And the next thing I know, I'm taking third place. $7,500 more in my pocket, the satisfaction of beating Jessica, the satisfaction of beating everyone but Ramon and Courtney was fantastic. Price, I mean, you can't even put a price on that. You really, you cannot. It's amazing. I still kid Courtney about beating me by five minutes, too. I love that girl. Something that I did to myself, okay? I put myself, I shuffled myself down lower in the queue. No one did it to me. I put myself there because it's safe. If you're doing stuff for everybody else all the time, it's safe because you don't have to worry about you. Oh, here, let me take care of that for you. Oh, let me do this for you. Oh, yeah, you know, you know who you are, okay? Listen, when we fly, it's the same thing over and over. When that little yellow mask drop, what are you supposed to do? Secure your own. Let me do it like they do it. Secure your own. You know, it's this and it's this. Secure your own and then help someone else. Well, I had that all backwards, but I've got it right now. I'll put my mask on, and then I'll help you, and you, and you. And if I have to, I'll kick that door open, and we'll all get out of this plane alive. That's the kind of attitude you need to have now. You've got to put your mask on first. It's not selfish. It's a priority. Move yourself up in the queue. Move yourself up. Take yourself serious. Put yourself a little bit higher. But be ready. There'll be a little bit of fallout, because you will change who you are. People are used to you being a certain type of person and putting everybody else first. There'll be, some, there'll be some pushback, there'll be some backlash. Talk through it, explain it. Make sure everybody's on the same page with you. Your circle of influence may change. Fortunately for me, as crazy as this sound, I got back to Mesa, Arizona, and I found out one neighbor to the right of me is an amazing marathon runner. He's an attorney by trade, started learning about marathons. Two years later, he's this amazing marathon runner. He's my technical guy. Another guy down the road, just a couple of houses, my daily running buddy, he had his little GPS thing, and so I've got my personal guide on every run. He still runs with me to this day. I have a running crew of four guys, and we go and do all these crazy events. I don't know, I don't think I can run alone. I have this circle of influence, it's incredible. I have friends that are exercise therapists, physical therapists, massage therapists. It's incredible, it's amazing. Improve your circle of influence, and it will improve who you are. The people with whom you associate they do define you. The company you keep does define you. Be around positive people. Be around people that are uplifting. I'm now in the CrossFit community. I'm opening a gym when I return home. Trust CrossFit of Mesa, Arizona. Being part of that community is amazing. People from all over America share information with me, give me trade secrets, things that normally wouldn't happen. I mean, look, you got the Battelle on the floor guy sitting here, you know. They're jaded. They're like, ah, I'm not telling them nothing. It's okay, okay? It's okay to share, boys. It's okay. And so I find myself in this situation where there's others that want me to succeed. So I'm surrounding myself with people that want me to succeed. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It just doesn't stop. It just keeps growing and getting better. You know, they call uh, CrossFitters Kool-Aid drinkers. Yeah, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Someday I hope to mix the Kool-Aid, okay? Pretty soon I'll be making the Kool-Aid, come up with my own flavor. Build that circle of influence. I make a plan, and I stick with it. And then if I complete that plan, I'll make another one. Right now the plan is, open this gym. And I'm as scared as I was at every way in I have no idea if I'm gonna land flat on my face, if anyone's gonna show up, if I'm gonna be the worst CrossFit trainer in the history of CrossFit, if they're gonna run me out of town on a rail, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'm giving it everything I've got. And if I fail, it's because I failed. It's not because I left anything to chance. I talk to people about little tips. You know, you wanna, you wanna do this 100 day challenge, you wanna, make it a, you wanna make an impact, you wanna change your life, okay? Treat those workouts like you would an appointment with a doctor or a dentist, I kid you not. Meg Knuckles in my neighborhood is get credit for that. I did not come up with that myself. Sweet neighbor of mine did, she's a genius, okay? Treat that like you would any other appointment, okay? Be realistic when you make those plans. Don't think you're gonna work out five days a week all of a sudden. Be smart, take care of your body, okay? 
when I talk about silencing the critics, mostly I'm talking about myself. I was my own worst critic. Perhaps some of you can identify with that. You know, I would, I would just beat myself up. And it got old, it got tired. So I don't do that now. I try to be realistic, even with my time. I don't know if it's like ADD or what it is, but I would think I could accomplish all these things in a day, and I just can't. I would think, okay, go do this task. It should take 30 minutes. Reality, two hours. Okay, you're going to Jiffy Lube for an oil change. It's not going to be 30 minutes. I don't care what the guy says on the phone. And the guy at Walmart that's going to fix your tire, yeah, you log him four hours a time. Just get a ride home. Okay, be realistic with your time. Silence those critics, especially the voices in your head. 445, 225. Absolutely amazing to think that I did that in roughly six months of time. I'd reached my goal weight about 10 days before the finale, so I just kind of hid in my home. You know, I was paranoid that I didn't want anybody to see me, and, you know, it just, uh, it was such an incredible time in my life, and I couldn't believe that I actually got to a goal weight. I mean, I weighed less than I was in high school. And how amazing was that? I was looking at all my old shirts from high school, trying them on, and it was incredible. You know, I even tried on, you know, we used to wear those half shirts under the football pads. I even sported that bad boy around. And uh, couldn't believe it. I was like, is this really me? Is this really happening? It's okay when good things happen. It's, it's still hard for me to accept a compliment. It's still hard for me to have someone come up and tell me, oh, yeah, I saw you do this. and It was great. I'm like, I don't know why. Why can't I just say thank you? That's so cool. You know, I think I'm getting better at it. But I'm still working on it. I'm not perfect. Trust me, I have a long ways to go. My wife keeps a little PDF of all my shortcomings. You know, we'll get that out on the web. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm growing. Okay. You guys can do the same thing. I'm not better than anyone in this room. No one. I am better than no one. Okay. I got that. I got on a TV show. I had some opportunities. I rose to the challenge. Okay. Anyone and everyone here can accomplish their goals. You honestly and truly can. You just need to follow these steps, okay? Figure out why. Come up with attainable goals. Be realistic. Get out there and get to work. And then when the going gets tough, think back. Think back, why am I doing this? Why? And just become unstoppable one moment at a time. Just take each moment for what it brings. Thank you for being here. Thank you, John. Um, we're going to take uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, two or three? Sure. Floor is open. Right here. Why CrossFit? Uh, I found out that CrossFit is, for me, part of who I am. Like when I was in high school, we would do the deadlifts and the clean and jerks. I didn't do any of the gymnastic movements. I couldn't do dips or anything like that. But all of a sudden, here I am in my early 40s, and I'm going back and doing the stuff when I was 17. And I'm like, I felt young again. I mean, I felt like an athlete again. And so it honestly is. It is, it is forging elite uh, fitness. It, I'm an athlete. I might not look good, but I always tell because everybody wants to work out with me. And it's okay, because I know I don't look good. I tell people, look, I'm no better than anybody else. The only difference is I can do this for six hours. You know, you'll be dead in two hours. But this is all I do. But yeah, CrossFit for me is because, you know, the functional movements, the high intensity, the constantly varied. That is what I need. And it's as close as a workout as you can get. People like want to get a show workout. Yeah, fine. Go do CrossFit. Do it three more times. And that's like a two-hour workout we would go through. Oh, it's incredible. It's, it's beautiful. But that's what it's all about. You're generally physically prepared for any task. And it's as close to a show workout as you can get. Great question. Yes, Christine. What have you about helping people start the process? Oh, right. What I've learned about helping people start the process, okay? Information. Information. People don't know where to start. What should I eat? How should I work out? I mean, just basic things. Real basic things. It's, it's calories in, calories out. But not just calories, the right kind of calories. And it's a workout that you enjoy. You know, I had to do certain things because I was under contract. No one here is under contract with NBC. Do fitness that you enjoy. 
Run Badger or Walk Badger or Crawl Badger, but get up there. Go walk. Hit the park. You know, the Tri-City, look, I go all over America. The Tri-Cities is gorgeous. There is so much to do here outside. The weather is perfect. The river is beautiful. There are parks. There are things to do. Just get out and do it. And trust me, once you get that motor started, you won't stop. I remember, I used to go do things with my boys when I was heavy and it was awful. And now I go, I'm leading the pack. We go to this place called Sunsplash in Mesa. It's a water park and there's these big inner tubes and stuff and they're four-man tubes. I mount that thing up and I run up there and I do that all day long. I couldn't do it a year ago, but I do it all day long now. Other dads must just watch and think, that guy's nuts. You know, I'm too busy having fun because I progressed and I got here one little moment in time. Thank you, Christine. Yes? How well did the producers predict the reality of the show? Oh, how, how well did the producers predict the reality of the show? Oh, okay, well, the way that works is they'll film about uh, 200 hours of film, okay, between all the camera crews, and they need to whittle that down to about 88 minutes. So what they want to do is they want to provide compelling television. So, um, I don't know where you're going with this, but <laughs> I said certain things, I did certain things, okay? But you could see who I was through my work ethic. I didn't go there to be your best friend. I didn't go there to be anybody's buddy. I had a wife at home with a five-year-old autistic kid and a nine-year-old spastic kid. I knew what she was going through. And so I went out there to work. I, I am a fun-loving, hilarious, wingnut, goofball, Jeff Thompson will tell you. I, seriously, I'm just wacky. But when I was out there, that was business, John. I was out there with a job to do. I wasn't out there to mess around and disrespect my wife's time, but, you know, um, did they need somebody to be the bad guy? Probably, you know, but uh, am I cool with that? I would do everything the same, I kid you not. Put me in a 15 passenger van right now, take me back to Calabasas and let's go. And I love going back out there. You know, I went back out there for a couple of episodes in season 13. I got no problem with the producers, love them to death. Things went my, things went my way. Um, because as much as they want to edit and splice, two things. You can't stop me, and the live finale, i got to speak my heart. And so I was able to tell it all exactly how it was, and you can't edit live TV. And so, yeah, they have a, they have a job to do. But also, look at season 13. If you say you want to kick somebody, that wasn't editing. You said you want to kick somebody. I didn't want to kick anybody. <laughs> I'd kick some butt. <laughs> yeah, all the way in the back. So how hard was it for me to transition from the show to real life? I'll let you know when I'm in real life. And then the maintenance, okay? I don't, I'm, I don't live a real life. My life is wacky at best. It's just not realistic, you know? Um, but I love it. I wouldn't change anything about it. I'd do it all the same. Maintenance has been difficult. It's hard. You know, I used to work out eight hours a day. And then after the show, I cut it down and I'd only work out four hours a day. And you guys are all saying, wow, only four hours a day? Trust me, that was a breeze. And now, what I do now is I'm eating a paleo lifestyle, which is also called like the low glycemic lifestyle, and I'm doing CrossFit. But I do like two to three times what normal CrossFitters do, just because that's all I do. So I have a routine. I get up at 5.30 in the morning. I go work out. I'll go back at 9 a.m. You know, I'll get the kids off or get them taken care of. Go back at 9 a.m. and do another workout, which is just insane. But that's what I have to do. I'm putting on a lot of muscle. I, I, my, my CrossFit, we do everything by times or reps. Everything's just looking really good. I have a long ways to go, but it's looking so much better than when I first started. I ran a half marathon uh, maybe five, six weeks ago. The only prepping I did was CrossFit. I used to run 30, 40 miles a week. All I do now is CrossFit, and I still ran like a 213, and so, which is a, a respectable time for a guy my size and my age. But yeah, the maintenance, I'm petrified that I'm going to end up 445 pounds again. I'd be lying if I said otherwise. I think about it every day, all day. It's all I think about. Not all, but it's on the top of my mind. But yeah, the maintenance and, and the getting back to reality, there is, no, there is no reality. I mean, it's nuts, but I'm good with it. Trust me, because I get to be here. You know, I get to see all you wonderful people. And to me, this, I, I wouldn't do anything different. I wouldn't have anything be different. This is amazing to me. This feels so good. I feel so welcome here. Any other brave souls? All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it.
Thank you so much, John. What an inspirational message. As we've mentioned, today's luncheon topic and speaker have been planned to officially kick off the Chamber's Good Health is Good Business 100 Days of Wellness Challenge. It's been put together in partnership with the Benton Franklin Community Health Alliance and a great group of volunteers. To provide a brief explanation of the program and how your company and employees can participate, is the Chamber's Government Affairs Director, Patrick Conrad. Good afternoon. I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to follow John, but uh, if you want to give me a standing ovation when I'm done, I'd be more than happy to take it. So uh, our Good Health is Good Business um, kicks off on August 13th, and it runs through November 21st, which is a Wednesday. Hold on, Wednesday, there we go. And so uh, registration, the deadline is on Friday, August 10th. So what we have so far is we have three different contests, which is for individual employees. It uses a scorecard to accumulate points. It's $10 per employee, and a t-shirt is included, and we have one in the back if you want to see what it looks like when we're completed. Uh, first place is $1,000 cash. Second place wins an iPad, and third place is a $250 fitness package. And you can see here, it's kind of hard to see up there, but uh, this is what the scorecard looks like. We have it uh, in the back if you want to take a look, but it has over 60 ways to earn points, which include basic exercise, nutrition, stress-reducing activities, positive habit-forming activities, and other fun things, such as visiting a farmer's market or organizing a work recess activity. As I mentioned, the cost is $10. The t-shirts are in the back and the, they're sponsored by Cadillac Medical Center, a regional medical center. Our second contest is the ultimate challenge competition. This is similar to the biggest loser where it is based on a percentage of weight loss. It will start with a confidential weigh-in before the competition and afterward. It's $10. You get a water bottle, which is also sponsored by Cadillac. Unfortunately, we don't have those here today. First place again is $1,000, second place is an iPad, and third place is the $250 fitness package. The last competition that we have is for businesses that have a wellness program in place. It is called the Healthy Business Designation, and uh, members can submit their wellness program and receive a rating from our committee, and we will award them given the, uh, the best three programs that we determine. So during the 100-day challenge, your company will designate a wellness worksite coordinator, and uh, we will send out a weekly email, which is called the Weekly Wellness Wire. This will include an email loaded with tips, information, and discounts to help make the challenge fun. This email is sponsored by Vista Engineering Technologies. All of the information uh, and applications are on the back table. Uh, we also have them on our website at www.tricityregionalchamber.com or as I mentioned you can stop by the booth in the back and I'd be happy to walk you through the process. We are really excited to launch this new program and hope that you pick up an information packet on your way out and take it back to your offices and have your employees sign up for what should be in a very exciting first year of this program. So let's take advantage of the great weather we have here during the summer and late fall and get active, get healthier, and promote a healthy lifestyle. Everybody's taking my script today. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's next? Sorry. Thank you. I jinxed myself at the very beginning making fun of Lori like that. Um, okay, finally, let's welcome everyone who made today happen. The Benton Franklin Community Health Alliance for sponsoring our luncheon. The Three Rivers Convention Center for providing us with a healthy and delicious meal today, I think. Our speaker, John Rode. Charter Communications, who filmed and will be rebroadcasting this program. 
and all of the members who are exhibiting today as part of the Good Health is Good Business program lunch. Be sure to visit their tables in the back and uh, stop by and see them on your way out. Thank you all for attending the membership meeting this afternoon and remember it is good business to do business with Tri-Cities Regional Chamber members. Thanks.